I want to speak to you this morning about a message that most likely you already figured out. Walking through the doors of opportunity. But I want to present that in the world we live in today, this message is not only for believers, though it's going to be tailored specifically to Christians. If you do not know how to discern opportunities when God presents them, not only you will miss on entering the new phase in your life, not only you will miss the new room in your life, you might end up not even surviving the season that you are in. I want you to open your Bibles with me and we're going to look at the man in the Bible who missed a very huge opportunity and draw lessons from that. 1 Kings chapter 20 and verse 42. Then he said to him, thus says the Lord, because you have let, because you have let slip out of your hand a man whom I appointed to utter destruction, therefore your life shall go for his life and your people for his people. Now let me, let me give you a little bit of the background story of this. Ahab, the Bible calls him the worst king, the most evil king in the Old Testament. He was passive. His wife was really bad. She was like a witch on steroids. Her name, you probably have heard, her name is Jezebel. If you have a wife named Jezebel, I pray for you. But if you have a wife or a husband that acts like Jezebel, you need to be delivered. Ahab had a wife named Jezebel. He himself wasn't good either. But Ahab had Elijah. And Elijah decided to close heaven that it didn't rain. And one day Elijah comes to Ahab and said, if you gather all of your false prophets that you have on the payroll at the Mount Carmel, and I'm going to come as a prophet of God and we will have a showdown. And so that's what happened. The prophets of Baal, they had this whole procedure. They cut themselves, they prophesied. And then of course, Elijah made fun of them. He says, cry louder. Maybe your God went to the bathroom. <laughs> Pretty nasty thing to say, but you know, Elijah is brutal. When they finished crying, nothing happened. Nobody responded. Elijah set up the altar. The fire of God came. And Elijah does this crazy thing, pretty R-rated. He kills all the prophets, all hundreds of prophets of Baal and some other prophets just totally in that. I mean literally in one day, Elijah got rid of the witchcraft that was on the payroll of Israel. And then he comes to Ahab, because Ahab is not going to do anything, he's very passive. His wife makes all the rules and keeps the kingdom. Ahab's like, oh, okay, we lost the prophets, it is what it is. And he says, Ahab, get in your chariot because the rain is coming. And everybody wanted the rain. And the Bible says, Elijah was running as, Eli as, as, as Ahab was riding his chariot and the rain came. So Ahab was happy, the rain came. And it seems like something shifted in Ahab because Ahab, the next time we meet Ahab, we see that an enemy comes against Ahab and the prophet now speaks to Ahab and Ahab listens. Before, Ahab had witch doctors speaking to him, but now a prophet, now not Elijah most likely, a different prophet speaks to him and says, hey, there's a king that's coming and I will give you victory so that you will know that I am the Lord. And Ahab doesn't kill the prophet. He says, so how will I have this victory? And the prophet says, well, you're going to have to be the first one to attack. Ahab says, okay. He goes and does exactly what the prophet says. Ahab has a victory. But the enemy escapes. Somebody say escapes. No, I didn't hear you in the second century say escapes. The enemy escapes. So the prophet comes back to Ahab. I want you to notice Ahab is, is having this momentum with God. Bad king, but had these moments on the Mount of Carmel. All the witch doctors are dead and now his wife doesn't seem to have this stronghold on his life and now he is hearing from God. And now the prophet comes back to Ahab and say, Ahab, I know you got this victory. And the enemy what? And the enemy what? 
escape. He says the enemy is going to come back again in the spring because this is what the enemy thinks is that their God is the God of the hills. I'll fight them in the valley and I will win. And God's prophet says to Ahab, because they insulted me, I'm going to prove to them that I am not just the God of the mountains. I'm the God of the valleys and I'll give you another victory. But make sure you prepare for that victory. Ahab says no problem. He prepared. Of course, like God said, the enemy comes back. Now, Ahab has a great victory. And now this time, the enemy didn't escape. The enemy was caught. God put the enemy in Ahab's hands. And guess what Ahab does? Ahab, the Bible says, let the enemy slip from his hands. Somebody say, slip through your fingers. Or somebody say, slip through your fingers. So the first time the enemy escaped, God doesn't hold him responsible because it was out of his control. The second time God puts the enemy in his hands and the enemy slipped through his fingers. Now, how did the enemy slip through his fingers? Is that Ahab, this king, called the enemy his brother. So instead of treating it like the enemy, in fact, he picked the enemy up from walking and says, come up on my chariot, my brother. What? The guy's been trying to kill you. You got some weird brothers, Ahab. That's not your bro. That's an enemy. Mistake number one. Mistake number two is that he makes an agreement with them. An agreement with someone God called him to attack. So God puts the enemy in his hands. He calls him his brother. He makes an agreement with him. He doesn't destroy him. He lets him go. He releases him. While this is happening, he still had the victory. There's another prophet. Are you tracking with me? Are you tracking with me? There's another prophet. He goes to a random guy on the street and says, thus says the Lord, hit me. And the guy looks at him, he said, what? He said, please strike me. He says, uh -uh, I ain't hitting anybody. He says, because you didn't hit me, a lion will kill you. And the lion killed the guy. Lord, keep those prophets away from me who come and tell me to hit him. I, I don't want lion to eat me. So this guy, literally, he got eaten by lions for refusing to... Some of you is like, if somebody would come to me and give me a word from God, hit me, you're like, man, that is the sweetest word I've received in my life. I'm like, one time or two times. <laughs> so this prophet, so this is happening behind the scenes, comes to the second person and say, please strike me. The guy's like, no problem. I've been waiting to hit something. And literally the Bible says he inflicts a wound on the prophet's face. So the prophet covers his bandaged face, sits on the side and Ahab is passing by and, the, and this prophet pretends to be a soldier and he says, Ahab, I, I, I have a problem, I have a situation. And he says, and now there's like another story that's developing there. He says, I was put in charge of guarding an enemy and my commander told me if I lose this enemy, I have to either lose my life or I have to pay a large sum of money. And Ahab, I don't know what happened. I lost the guy. And Ahab says this, you just pronounced your own judgment. And the prophet takes the curtain off of his face and says, thus says the Lord, because you let the enemy slip, you will die because you didn't kill. You didn't destroy. Now you will be destroyed. It's a very sobering story. What is the application of that? I'm going to give you in just a moment. But I do want to remind you that our life has moments that create momentum. For example, you have a moment where you come and you get saved. God touches you and you have this momentum of going after God. Those moments are the divine opportunities where God wants you to now mature in your momentum and not give up. There are moments where God presents 
as something into your hands. He puts it into your hands like deliverance and freedom. You get delivered, demons come out and you got this moment that marks your life. But if you are careless, if you are casual, if you let things slip out of casualness, carelessness, not only you miss the opportunity of seeing your life changed, you actually miss the opportunity of stepping into something new and you find yourself being drawn back into the old life and sometimes even into misery. There are moments where God gives you and these moments are moments of opportunity where you feel during the night you had a dream. You wake up out of nowhere and there is this sense of drawing God has to pray. You need to rededicate yourself to prayer. Rededicate yourself to reading the Word. And you didn't feel that. It's almost like this, this magnetic pull toward God. What happens is God is drawing you. Now most of us will be like, well, it was just a bad dream. Let me take something to help me fall asleep. And you're going back to sleep. What I want to teach you today is the power of recognizing the moments God gives you and maximizing them. Because those moments are doors into a new season. Those moments are doors into the new chapter. Those moments are doors into a changed life. When you don't recognize those moments, you can find yourself being like Ahab where you are not only stuck behind a closed door but drifting back to where you used to be. The word opportunity means it's a set of circumstances that makes it possible to do something. Did you know that even the devil looks for opportunities to do his work? The devil is an opportunist. He doesn't just do his work all the time. Now he does it all the time. He's not successful all the time. When is the devil most successful? When he has the opportunity. The scripture says about Jesus in Luke chapter 4 verse 13. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until when? An opportune time. The devil knows, I can't strike you anytime. You need to, I need to have an opportunity. And that opportunity is presented when you open the door for that opportunity. Because all, all temptation is, is this. You're not going to open. And the devil says, but when you begin to open the door of opportunity, I can strike you. That's why in Ephesians it says, do not give the devil an opportunity. See, some of us are dealing with generational curses where somebody opened the door. But Paul is saying, if there has been no legal right for the devil, don't give him an opportunity. Let him knock and there is no opportunity for him. The devil does his work through opportunities. Don't give him an opportunity. That's why Paul tells us in Galatians, excuse me, in Romans, he says, make no provisions for the flesh. Why? Because if you make a provision for the flesh, the devil is an opportunist. He will exploit the opportunity you offered him for his advantage. The devil is like a mosquito. You open the door, he will get in. You may say, but I don't believe Christians can have demons. Well, devil doesn't care what you believe. It's kind of like saying, I don't believe Americans can have mosquitoes. Mosquitoes don't care what you believe. When you give an opportunity to a mosquito, mosquito is going to get in. Whether you own the house, it doesn't matter what you vote. It doesn't matter if you have an American flag over your house. If there is an opportunity, mosquito gets in without invitation. Because opportunity is the invitation. So as Christians, we must understand this is how opportunities work. The devil knows if you give me an opportunity, I will get in. So we don't give him an opportunity. The second thing I want to highlight and that is this. God opens doors of opportunities. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 12, it says, Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach the Christ's gospel, and a door was opened to me by the Lord. The Lord opens doors. Somebody say amen. amen. 
Revelation 3.8, it says, I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door and no one can shut it. For you have little strength and have kept my word and have not denied my name. 1 Corinthians 16.9, for a great and effective door has been opened to me, but there's many adversaries. Acts chapter 14 verses, verse 27, and when they had come and gathered to the church together, they reported all the things that God has done with them. And He had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. So I want you to notice a common thing. The devil is looking for an opportunity to do his work. He can't just do it any single time. He wants to. He's not effective any single time. He's waiting for an opportunity. And you can give that opportunity by slacking in your faith and by just kind of slacking and just 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 letting go doing whatever and the ne next thing that happens is the enemy takes advantage you're like man how did he get in well he's an opportunist you didn't have to invite him you didn't have to say you don't have to say hail satan you don't have to say satan come i mean you just simply uh, provide an opportunity if you provide the opportunity he's an opportunist and he will come in Keep slacking in your purity and you will fall into pornography. Keep slacking in your convictions and you will fall into drunkenness. Keep slacking in your convictions and you will fall into adultery. Keep slacking. He will take advantage of an open opportunity. So that's one negative side. The positive side is our God also works by giving us opportunities to take us into new seasons and new blessings in life. Think of opportunities like waves in the ocean. You don't make the wave. But if you are a surfer, you wait for the wave and you jump on the wave. Think of an opportunity as God providing that and then you and I have to take advantage of that opportunity and jump in it. Let me share with you how the opportunity is like a door. First thing about that opportunity is like a door. It gives you access. When you have an opportunity, you have an access into an experience, a room, a circle, a level you didn't have before. See, this door is what keeps me from the other room. And God, the Bible says, we read, God can open doors of opportunity. The reason why you and I need to recognize opportunities in our life is because opportunities usher us into a new seasons that a lot of us been praying for and desiring. And you need to recognize when the door is open and when the door is not open. Because it changes your world. It changes the room you are in. I remember right during COVID, a good friend of mine, Isaiah Saldivar, he came, he preached in our church. And then he came to my house after the service and he sat at my round kitchen table and he started to tell me about how he's been YouTubing and how God has been using it to touch other people. In the back of my head, I'm listening to that. And I was like, man, I don't have time for this nonsense. I'm a pastor. I preach at the church. I don't preach in front of a camera. Plus during COVID, I tried. The internet failed all the time. And I'm, I'm awkward around the camera. This is just not for me. And as he's speaking, and this is when you know the door, the doors, the opportunity are opening. Something that's outside of my mind and my spirit begins to burn. I can't explain it. Where I feel the Holy Spirit opening my heart and I'm beginning to see a different world that I'm not in. I'm beginning to see a world that God wants me to get in and impact the world through that. But in my mind, I'm like, that's not for me. I'm not going to do that. That's crazy. I don't even have a room. I don't have an internet for that. But my spirit sees an image and I feel something is opening. When he went back to the hotel, I went to sleep and my heart caught fire. I couldn't sleep all night. My mind is like buzzing with ideas. And next morning I text Everett like at four o'clock in the morning. I said, Everett, my whole life just changed. Everything is going to change. It was like, uh, what is going to change? I said, YouTube. He said, yeah, I know YouTube. I said, no, no, you don't understand. YouTube. God's going to do something. And that week or next week, I started to live stream. And it went from you know, 20,000 subscribers or 30,000 subscribers to a million subscribers in about a year. I meet people today in the gym. I meet people today on the parking lot of our church. I meet people today in Houston airport. I met, pe I met people just two days ago in the coffee shop downtown Houston where I got lost and somebody was sitting across the coffee shop and comes in and he says, I just watched the video. God took me the ministry, our ministry, to a different room because when he opened the door, I recognized it. 
doors give access. Opportunities give access. When you recognize those opportunities, especially when God opens them. It's one thing when you try to break it, but it's another thing when God opens the door and you recognize it. You're about to step into a new season. See, when God draws your heart to prayer, it's God opening the door of opportunity to take you into a new room, to take you into a new season. When God sets you free and you begin to get this conviction, man, I need to cut this off. I need to add this in my life. I need to add discipline. It's God preparing you to take you into a new room. I apologize. I know it's nine o'clock, but I, I, I'm burning inside right now. So if I just explode, for those of you first time, like, why is he yelling? I don't know. <laughs> A word shot up in my bones. Come on, somebody. The second thing that the door offers as an opportunity is this. <sighs> Doors are often closed. And they're open for a short time. Doors aren't open all the time. Otherwise, you don't need them. The only reason we have doors is so that they remain closed most of the time. Which means when a door opens, you must understand it will not stay open. There are opportunities God gives and this is the mistake we make. Is we think, I can do it tomorrow. That's what Pharaoh said when Moses asked him, when do you want the frogs removed? And Pharaoh, a dummy. If this would have been me, I said, I want the frogs removed yesterday. Pharaoh says, I want them removed tomorrow. I could sleep one more night with the frogs. When God opens the door, God wants you to take advantage of them right now. Because when Noah opened the door for people to come in, they were closed after seven days. When the door was open for the, for the virgins to come in, they were closed after a few hours. And the other ones came in, it's like, hey, I thought it would be always open. It's not always open. You must recognize the day of God's visitation because that day has an expiration date. When God calls you to repent and you think, I still have tomorrow, you might not have tomorrow. You must recognize an open door of God's opportunity in your life and respond to it quickly because that door is not meant to be open all the time. The third thing I want you to notice is not only the doors are often closed, but sometimes you got to knock. If you notice you've been standing too long, the doors haven't been opened. The God says, knock and it will be open to you. In Colossians, Paul tells us, he says that pray that God will open the door of opportunity for us. If you're a single person, you want to be married and you realize maybe you're a lady, and you realize all the good, good men and there's a lot less of them than good women. All the good men are taken. And whatever that's left is not always good. And I know that, you know, they might be in church. But understand, church is like a hospital and not everybody responds to treatment the same way. So you got to be careful. Don't be fooled by somebody saying, oh, I'm in church. They might be sick in church. And when you realize the doors aren't opening and if, if they open it, you're like that paralyzed person. It's like somebody jumps in and somebody takes that person. What you can do is this, is you can knock. And you say, Lord, you didn't give me the gift of celibacy, but you gave me a gift of prayer. <laughs> give me a husband. Jesus. A good husband. I know I wanted the colored one. I know I wanted the tall one. I know I wanted the rich one. Now I just want a good one. <laughs> Lord, I lower the expectation. Any good man, any good man, Lord. Open the door of opportunity. Amen. Now another thing that doors do is sometimes you have a key. A key is a preparation. There are times when the doors of opportunity are open. God is ready for you to come in. But you have to have a key. What is the key? The key is preparation. What does this mean? When the doors of opportunity are not open, don't spend your time camping. Spend your time preparing. 
because David didn't know he will kill Goliath that morning. This wasn't on his calendar. He didn't have a countdown. Oh, I have 365 days and I'm going to face Goliath. David was simply preparing, working on his keys, killing lion and the bear. And one day he stands in front of a battle. He doesn't even know he got the keys. And because he's been preparing, other people looked at this as a closed door. But David says, let me try my key. I killed a lion and I killed a bear. I'm going to kill Goliath and David steps into a new season of his life. He now becomes an armor bearer and now he has a new job position in the palace of the king. While others were waiting for God to open the door, David realized the door just needs you either to knock or to have keys. Do I have the keys necessary to open this door? That's why when you are a young person, maybe you want to get married. Don't wait for marriage, prepare for marriage. Don't wait for opportunities. Prepare for opportunities. Because breakthrough is when preparation meets opportunity. Blessing is when preparation meets opportunity. And there are many people who have an opportunity and the reason they couldn't come in is because they were never prepared for it. They were wasting their life instead of preparing for those opportunities. Prepare for that opportunity. When that opportunity comes, you have the key and the key is preparation. Don't wait. Prepare. Can somebody say amen? amen? The other part I want to highlight about doors and opportunities is thresholds. And this is huge. Before you can step into the room, when you start going into this new season, there is a threshold. And threshold is this season. When you're not in where you used to be and you are not where you should be you're in the middle. A threshold represents you're not in bondage anymore but you're not victorious yet. You're in the middle. A threshold represents you're not lost anymore but you're not being used by God like you really know God wants to use you. You're kind of somewhere in the middle, sometimes between the hard place and the rock. And many people get so stuck here. Maybe you're in a place where, you know, God is taking you to a deeper level of health and you're denying the sugar. You're walking away from all that junk eating and you're not where you used to be. You're motivated, but you're kind of in the middle. You're not losing any weight. You're kind of losing the motivation. You're not there yet, but you're not where you used to be, kind of in the middle. And I want to encourage you, pass through the transition of a threshold into the new season of your life. But the last thing I want to highlight about the doors and the opportunities is this. You got to be very careful not to enter every door that opens to you. Because some opportunities are tests, not blessings. Some opportunities are traps, not an open door from God. Don't be led by your sight and don't be led by everything that's open. Allow the Holy Spirit to guide you. Let me give you an example. King David was given a promise by God, he will be a king one day. And guess what happens? The Lord also gives him a promise, I will give you your enemy and you can do to your enemy whatever you want. And so one day King Saul goes to uh, use a restroom in a cave. And David with one of his men is in that cave. And David's man looks at David and says, look, God has opened the door. Let me strike Saul with one blow and Saul is going to be dead. And tomorrow we're going to be kings. We can do whatever we want. God's promise will be true. David recognized it's not an open door by God. It's a test by God. I can't take this open door right now. Why? Because it doesn't fit my size. Only walk through doors that fit integrity. If you have to walk through doors where you bend your convictions, you're stepping into the devil's territory. If you walk through doors where you have to sacrifice your family, to get rich and get ahead. It's not an open door from God. It's a trap. It's a test from God. If you have to sleep with Potiphar's wife to get to the top, you're not stepping into God's open door. You're stepping into the bait of Satan. And David realized, if I don't kill Saul, I have to spend next years in this wilderness. But I am not going to go through doors that don't fit God's integrity for my life. Because I know before I can step through the door open to me by God, the devil will have a door of compromise that will look like all the shiny things that God has promised, but it's just a trap. The devil will say, turn these stones into bread. And it's a trap. 
and Jesus says absolutely not shut the door but then a year later he turns bread and multiplies it because that's an open door from God I want to challenge you today recognize when God opens the door and step in recognize when there is a prompting from God and he says I'm challenging you in this season to pray more run when God invites you to do that when God knocks on your heart and says listen young man you got to step up in your purity don't make justification because God is giving you an opportunity right now and you may have tried to overcome your impurity before but when God brings the conviction he opens the door and when you step into that during the time there is grace that is there you can do that before that grace was given and you will try in your best effort and while it's adding to your preparation it's not adding to your victory until God gives you grace until God gives you grace I'm not saying that we wait don't live in righteousness and purity. Just wait till God gives us grace. I'm not saying that we walk in righteousness. We crucify our flesh. But there are those moments. I remember when I was addicted to pornography and, and I was knocking for God to set me free. God deliver me. God set me free. And it was in Spokane. I was a young man. I went to some kind of a conference. I was still I think in my 16 or 17 years of age. And I looked at something. I stayed in somebody's house. I looked at something on the computer. And it was bad. I felt so guilty. I fell on the floor and I cried out to God. I said, God, I can't do this anymore. I'm done. And I felt the Holy Spirit said, fast for seven days and I will set you free. I got up. That was the easiest seven day fast I've ever done in my life. God opened the door. During those seven days, it went so fast. Everything changed grace was given. The same thing I was doing before this season. Now I'm doing it this season but I'm in a total different season. I'm so glad I recognized that opportunity when God was inviting me to go deeper in purity, go closer in righteousness. Recognize those moments when God puts it into your hand. Don't let it slip. There are times things escape you. You've done your best and honestly God doesn't judge you for what you don't control but God holds you responsible for what you, He puts into your hand that you've been wanting, you've been praying for and God gives you that opportunity. There's a grace attached to that opportunity and sometimes we're like we casually treat it and it slips, it falls, it cracks and we're like yeah I'm just waiting for another opportunity. That opportunity might not come. Take advantage. Walk through the door. Of opportunity. The last thing I want to share today with you is this. A wasted opportunity is a tragedy. Luke chapter 13 verse 25. When the master of the house has risen up and shut the door, you will begin to stand outside and knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open for us. And he will answer and say to you, I do not know you where you're from. Luke chapter 19 verse 44 and level you and your children within you to the ground and they will not leave in you one stone upon another. What a severe punishment because you did not know the time of your visitation. Proverbs 10 5 He who gathers in the summer is a wise son. He who sleeps in the harvest meaning an opportunity is open is a son who causes shame. Isaiah 55 6, seek the Lord, watch this, while he may be found. Call on him while, while, that means it won't last all the time, while, meaning there is a drawing, there is a pool, there is this conviction, there is this, this feeling, no it's not about a feeling but you feel that drawing from God to while he is near, God is drawing you. If you let it fall through the cracks, and you don't respond and you don't walk through, you might be in a place where you missed that. Ahab missed the opportunity to destroy the enemy. It caused him death. Israel missed the opportunity to enter the promised land. And the next day they tried to do it but now it was closed. A man with one talent missed the opportunity to multiply and he was thrown into outer darkness. The greatest lost opportunity is the opportunity to know Christ and to make it to heaven. But the second greatest lost opportunity is the opportunity to work for Jesus and to receive His words. Well done, good and faithful servant. 
Hebrews chapter 3 verse 15, while it is said today, if you hear my voice, do not harden your hearts as in a day of rebellion. I want to ask you today, which opportunities God is giving you that you're ignoring? I want to ask you today, what talents God has given you that are lying dormant? In what areas of your life you're ignoring God's voice? What relationships God has placed in your life that you're neglecting to nurture? What ministries opportunities, what ministry opportunities God has opened for you that you're not stepping into? What promises God has made to you that you're not claiming in faith? What resources God has provided for you that you're not utilizing for His glory? Where have you allowed fear to prevent you from fulfilling God's plan? What area of your character God is refining but you are resisting? What opportunities for growth and learning God has given you that you are ignoring? What acts of service God has prompted you to perform but you are running from them? What areas of spiritual discipline, prayer, fasting or giving you are neglecting? Have you become complacent in your walk with God? What dream God has placed in your heart that you're not pursuing? What areas of your life God has specifically highlighted that need repentance? And you're making excuses. What parts of your past God has forgiven you but you're still holding on to? Where God has called you to step out in faith but you are hesitating? What opportunities to witness for Jesus? Jesus made it very clear but you're not stepping into. What area of your life God is calling you to surrender fully to Him? What commandment of God are you willfully disobeying? In what ways you are allowing the worldly distractions to pull you from God's purposes? It's in your hands. Ahab, don't let it slip. God doesn't hold you responsible for the times the enemy escaped. But God does hold you responsible. Why? Because He has given you the grace to squash whatever He has given you. If God gave you the spark, add some wood to it. If God draws you, run after Him. If God sets you free, add discipline to it. If God convicts your heart, confess your sin. Turn away from that sin because there is grace on that season of your life. When God invites you, if Jesus stands at the door and says, Behold, I stand and knock. If you open the door and you hear my voice, I will come in and dine. Behold means I'm not going to be knocking all the time. That means you got to open the door right now. Today, says the Holy Spirit, if you hear my voice, respond. There are days I've experienced this person that marked my life. I wasn't planned. I didn't plan to empty my bank account. I didn't save my money so I can give it away. But on my flight to Sacramento, the Holy Spirit knocked. Of course, I said, are you sure that's the Holy Spirit? Could you provide the verification code? You know, and once it's verified and Holy Spirit is patient, when He sees that you're hesitating because you sure truly don't know, He's patient if you're honest. If you're honest, He's patient. If you're dishonest and you're making excuses, He's not going to keep knocking. And then when we gave that sacrifice, it changed my whole life. But I wasn't planning for that. But my heart was ready to respond. About two years ago when we started with the building campaign and some of you saw that very big sacrifice that I wasn't planning for that either. That wasn't my plan. My plan was to buy land in Benton City and, and retire there. God bless you Austin and Crystal and everybody else who lives in Benton City. I was planning to migrate there. But the Holy Spirit knocked on the door and He said, I want you to do that. And guess what happened? I stepped into something new. My whole life changed after that in the area of finances. Things changed. Same thing happened when it comes to the ministry and YouTube. Same thing happened with the fast. I remember even this week, I started just, just woke up one day and there was this drawing, this hunger that came that I couldn't explain. It wasn't mine. And I felt the Holy Spirit say, so He says, I want you to fast for three days. I said, Lord, it's the 4th of July. I'm like, who fasts on 4th of July? He says, you will. <laughs> you said, but, but God, that's not falling with the plan. Please understand, but I recognize one thing. If He calls, I'm going to run. If He draws, I'm going to follow. If He convicts, 
and he highlights something, I'm gonna come clean before that area and I'm, and I'm gonna bring it before God. Especially when he highlights. Why? Because there is grace when God knocks. When God convicts you about your weight and says, listen, that's not healthy what you're doing. You gotta put some, you gotta put some, this, you gotta change right away. Not like, oh, next week there's a birthday party coming up. No, you gotta literally that day take everything that's junk in your fridge and destroy it. Why? Because you gotta change when God convicts. Maybe you're living with your girlfriend and you know it's wrong. You've been justifying it and you're coming in and the heart begins to beat and God convicts you because God's word clearly states you're like, yeah, but you know, we could just do two more months. I mean, we've done it for two months already, like two more months before the wedding. You know, what is the big deal? What is the big deal is God is knocking. You gotta enter in into righteousness and purity. What the big deal is God is convicting. You gotta enter in because your life is about to change for good. If you don't respond and you say, God, it's too hard. God, I'm not going to do it. You don't stay where you are. You always go back to where you didn't even want to be. You get pulled back. I'm going to finish you with a story. There was a young, an older man. I met him when our church just started. His name was Jason. Jason was a drug addict and an alcoholic. And Jason saw that opportunity to go to rehab and get rehabilitated. Jason went there. Jason had children. And after his first year of rehabilitation, he was ready to go home. But there was this drawing from God. I can't go back home yet to my children because I was so addicted for so long. I need to stay one more year in rehab so that I can truly be free indeed. So he calls his family to tell them that I'm so sorry. I would love to come back. I love you so much. And it's because I love you. You don't need a drug addict as a dad. You don't need an alcoholic as a dad. Just give me one more year so that you can have me as a sober, good man for the rest of your life. Right when he finished that, his wife said, your son developed a rare heart disease. He's going to be in the hospital. He needs surgeries. You need to come back right now. And he told his wife, he said, I'm not a heart surgeon. I can't heal my son. But if I leave and my son gets recovered and he has a drug addict as a dad, what kind of legacy I will leave to my son? Of course, his wife didn't understand the decision. He wasn't happy. The whole family turned against him and Jason stayed for one more year. Within that year, God healed his son. He returned back and now it's been that I know of for the last 20 years. He didn't touch alcohol again, didn't touch drugs and his son has a good dad. At the same time, there was a young man that got saved in our ministry. On fire young man. His mom was a prostitute in Seattle. He was involved in drugs. He got saved but because he wasn't truly discipled and delivered and there was these drawings to his past, he kept sliding back into his past and he fathered one child and he fathered a second child and there came this moment where we told him, you need to go to rehab because you don't need just deliverance, you need to get rehabilitation. We already found the rehab for him, actually the same rehab that this man Jason came from. We went there, we, me and Pastor Ilya, we arranged things for him and we said, listen, we got you covered. You don't have to pay anything, we'll drive you there. And I remember this young man looked straight at me. And he said, you guys don't know what it's like to be a father. And we didn't because I didn't have children. Ilya didn't have children. He said, I will never sacrifice my children to go to rehab. I got this. I'm just going to try harder. And I remember looking at him and said, I said, I hope you're right. But I feel like you're making a deadliest mistake because your daughter doesn't remember you right now. She's so young, but she doesn't need a drug addict. She needs a dad. And I'm sorry young man, but you can't be a dad because you're addicted to drugs. He spiraled into drugs, got a third child. He started doing heavier drugs and he would do this, he would repent, he would be here crying, manifesting and go back and do exactly the same thing. That opportunity to get his life changed never came back. And I remember when police arrested him at the memorial park here in Pasco, running around naked screaming about Jesus. 
they locked him up in an institution and then they released him because he did so much drugs he damaged his brain and then they put him in jail and there was an error made by the hospital but they did not transfer his paperwork to jail and they left him alone in the cell where he had a seizure and he beat his brains to death and I was at his funeral looking at his three children remembering a lost opportunity and now his kids don't have a dad because when God gives an opportunity don't make excuses step into it behold I stand at the door and knock if any man hears my voice Jesus isn't trying to rob you he wants to take you to a different room behold I stand and knock where is God knocking in your life I don't want to scare you. Please understand this is not doom and gloom message but I do want to warn you because I've seen too many people who stood in the door like a deer with the headlights and making excuses and that, that opportunity passes by and then they knock and they say, Lord open! But there's no more opening. Say yes to God when He convicts. Add discipline when He delivers. Run after Him when He draws. When He defeats the enemy go all the way destroy that thing I'm not talking about legalism I'm talking about running hard after Jesus when he gives you that grace when there's a grace to pray pray when God wakes you up and there's an anointing to intercede intercede in the small things recognize an opportunity because the opportunities they come and the opportunities they leave you know I mentioned to you about the whole YouTube thing I live streamed for about two years every week. It was a grace on that time. Now I don't feel, feel that grace. But my ministry went to a level that I've never been able to take on my own. I don't live stream as much but I'm in a different room right now. And I recognize that opportunity for me is closed now. To live stream every week to do all this stuff. There's other opportunities God is opening and so I have to be faithful and I recognize doors open and God closes them. And when He closes, it is what it is. I gotta wait for another wave when God brings that wave but when he does I gotta have my surf surfing board ready and I gotta be prepared to ride that wave. Amen.